So there's one similarity on one side, but there's also some discrepancy that has to be resolved if we want to uh, ask uh, if there's any relevance of this gene in FSHG. So we have now generated uh, what is called a tissue-specific knockout. So I'm not going in the details of how we do this, but basically it's possible to have uh, the gene broken or disrupted only in some tissue types of, uh, and we can choose the tissue type in which uh, we can delete the gene and have the gene uh, functioning normally in the rest of the body. So we have generated mice in which the gene is disrupted only in muscles and uh, these mice display some of the muscle-shaped defects that we've seen um, in the complete knockout. Um, but the good thing is that they survive as adults and it is possible to study the consequences of these early alterations in adult life without having some uh, muscle abnormalities. And what we know already is that they display some uh, loss of muscle strength and we have some uh, preliminary uh, results about histology, which uh, most of it being ongoing, but uh, we did find some symptoms that resemble uh, the description, anatomical and, and histological description of uh, FSHD biopsy. So that's, uh, that's very interesting. So now, could FAT1 be a new candidate player in FSHD? Um, and I just want to remind this, so this is what I said before, right? The may, uh, best known abnormality is located on chromosome 4, and I just remind on, on this. But what was very surprising to us was that the FAT1 gene was located a little bit further away on the same chromosome. So if you have the repeats here, you have a few more genes that's the string of DNA, and then you hit the FAT1 gene. So that was... Um, Basically, together with the similarity, that location made FAT1 be a compelling, provocative uh, possible new player in the disease. So you can either consider that uh, there might be mutations in the FAT1 gene, and because of the um, proximity of the FAT locus with the FSHD locus, you may consider that some of these uh, abnormalities are carried over together with the, FSA, uh, the, the contraction. But you may also simply uh, consider that it's just by chance that the gene is here, but what is striking is the similarity and there must be some intersection of the mechanisms. And uh, if you add consequences of uh, the contraction and alterations uh, of fat, then FAT1 alterations may contribute to FSHD symptoms. Um, so, the question is, now, how do we go there from these uh, observations to defining whether FAT1 is indeed a good uh, candidate? The first thing was, we know that if you break the gene in every cell, you have something more severe than FSHD. So, the question is, is the gene only um, uh, reduced or um, misfunctioning in muscles. So that was the first thing we wanted to try. Uh, and we checked in uh, muscle biopsies, either from adult patients um, or uh, from earlier stages, whether the gene was, uh, its expression was reduced. So the thing is the variability in adult patients made it difficult to, to reach uh, good consensus about whether it was reduced at adult stages, uh, but as I was convinced that some of these processes had to occur during embryonic life, then I insisted, uh, and that's when I contacted the Nicolas Levy lab, I insisted that maybe if there was any opportunity to work with fetal material, um, that that would be the place to look at. And, and we were very lucky to obtain material from uh, uh, fetuses that had been diagnosed uh, with FSHD1 and for which there was termination of pregnancy because these cases were from families with uh, history of, uh, of very severe cases. And um, basically this is like the uh, measurement of the expression level of FAT1 in several cases 
uh, of FSHD fetuses compared to age-matched controls. And um, there was like even one case with a very um, short contraction, which had a, a very strong reduction, but other cases too. And um, this uh, was an immunostaining performed on uh, muscle biopsies from actually that fetus, where you can see uh, just in, in red, it's like a marker of uh, the um, muscle fibers. Uh, in, in blue, you have nuclei, and uh, in, in green, you have FAT1. So you see that in control biopsies, FAT1 is present in the muscle structure in a striated way, and what happens in this FSHD case is that you have a drastic lowering, but a few places where you do detect the protein. And um, what I also need to say is that uh, this was happening in muscles, but when we looked at other tissues like the brain, it looked like there was no reduction. <coughs> so indeed, uh, the alterations uh, of expression of the FAT1 gene were tissue specific, were not occurring in every tissue. We didn't have access to kidney derived material to, uh, to also con confirm that the gene was not impaired in kidney, but that's a very likely possibility. Um, so now this seeing reductions of uh, expression of one gene in FSHD1 tissue is actually not a proof of causality because there are many other genes that, uh, for which the expression is altered uh, in FSHD1. Actually, if you take any of the ducts for target genes, they could be either up or down regulated. So there's no way to prove in this situation that um, what I showed you is responsible for the symptoms. So that's when we saw that it was interesting to uh, have access to these cases um, of FSH, clinically uh, clear FSHD cases, but for which the genetic testing uh, excluded either FSHD1 or FSHD2. And um, so there were two things that we did, and let me explain a little bit what we did. So in the first assay, um, we have, and, and this is, has been done by uh, Marc Bartoli in the Levy lab, and uh, what was done was a technique of compar uh, comparative genomic hybridization. So basically, the principle is to compare two DNAs. And here, uh, what I tried to show is that, uh, let's imagine we are comparing the same DNA. We label it uh, on one side in red, and on the other side in green. But if you compare the two uh, by measuring how much of every little fragment is present, you will detect that it's identical. So in, if now we compare to a reference, uh, reference DNA from a healthy individual, uh, DNA from a patient, you will be able to detect whether uh, everything is uh, identical or whether there are any changes. For example, you have to know that every gene is present in two copies. So what we find here is that uh, this individual has two stars, uh, two hexagons, um, two circles, two triangles and so forth. But then what happens in this one is that this hexagon is present only once and has been lost. So we will detect a loss at the level of the hexagon, but this uh, you see there's been an addition of two rectangles here, so this is a gain. 